In the summer of 1904, George Green commissioned Mitchell and Kenyon to film children leaving their schools. These are some of the most delightful films in the collection, illustrating the change in the Education Act, illustrating different aspects of the physical education regime that was brought in. George Green possibly showed these films at the Easter Fair in Blackburn and would have advertised to the parents, come and see your children on the screen. The films were shown as part of a 15-minute bioscope presentation. Other advertisements at the time tell us that the local children were always invited to the premier attraction on the fair and were part of the audience and shouted to the screen, look at me, I can see myself on the screen. Part of the exercises the children are doing appear to be an early form of calisthenics, marketed by the army and a part of a physical education regime. The school children scenes were very popular, not only with the children and the parents, but also in terms of the showmen, who commissioned these as another form of local pictures to follow on from the factory gate exits from the early 1900s. George Green had been associated with the heartlands of Mitchell and Canyon from the very early days and had commissioned films as early as 1898 for Mitchell and Canyon to be shown on his cinematograph show in Preston and Blackburn. Now we see the children waving to the camera. This is an example quite often in the films of Mitchell and Kenyon and often instigated by the cameraman behind, actually asking the children to express their appreciation of being filmed. Before the introduction of the Education Act from 1902, most of these children would have been working in the factories. When Mitchell and Kenyon came to Morecambe, they were actually working in partnership with A.D. Thomas of Thomas Edison Picture Company, and these formed part of a very successful group of films which are shown at the Winter Gardens in Morecambe. The Church Lads Brigade at Drill was filmed in Morecambe and actually shown the same evening at the Winter Gardens. You see the parade of the Church Boys Brigade. You also see the crowd reacting to being filmed because Thomas Edison advertises, watch it, Edison's operators are about. Come and see yourselves on the screen. So the responding of the camera is very much part of the publicity. The boys now are acting and doing their drill and their military exercises. The young boy in the front loses his place and then tries to maintain military discipline and doesn't actually succeed, as you see in the following scene.
When they were advertised, the actual brochure proclaimed, it's a happy idea that the management has hit upon to include in the collection a wonderful scene of the Morecambe church lads at drill. Needless to say, these pictures are followed with intense interest, and if you happen to be on the front when the photograph was taken, you can see yourselves in the same attitude as when the machine was passing. The film was shown at the Winter Gardens Music Hall on July the 3rd, 1901. Edison's show continued for two successful months in Morecambe, and so popular were the church lads at Drill that this film was also shown in other venues throughout the north of England. Now we see the customary surge of the crowd wanting to see themselves on the screen. This was filmed on the 6th of July 1901 and actually is the opening ceremony of the degree procession at the University of Birmingham where the new intake of women graduates actually received their degree. The local newspaper report at the time says that when the first woman graduate came to receive her degree from Joseph Chamberlain, the Chancellor, one of the students in the audience shouted the advice, kiss her, give her a cuddle, when she went up to receive her degree. It's difficult to ascertain which one of the ladies is actually the person who received their first degree from the university. However, the local report tells us that with a slight blush and a merry smile, the first girl from the University of Birmingham graduated, mounted the steps and approached the Chancellor and was greeted with cheers and loud applause from the audacious students in the audience. The operators with the straw boaters are actually part of Thomas Edison's camera crew and this film was shown as part of a two-month series at the Curzon Hall under the management of Waller Jeffs. Manchester Films and the Torpedo Flotilla form part of a two-month successful tour of Thomas Edison. This scene shows you the Torpedo Flotilla going under the Barton Bridge on the Manchester Ship Canal. On the opposite side of the bank you can see Thomas Edison's crew filming and this is one of the few examples we actually have of a film of the film crew operating. We actually have three films of the Torpedo Flotilla. They were actually advertised as part of a successful series as War in Manchester and were shown alongside the Queen's Funeral Procession and also the Brave Manchester Wagoners. When the films were shown at the St. James's Hall, Thomas Edison invited the whole of the ship's crew who were actually on the films to the gala performance on the opening night. Thomas Edison himself was one of the first people to be very directly associated with Mitchell and Kenyon. Originally a showman from Devon, he pretended to be the great Thomas Edison, the American inventor of cinematography, and travelled for three years in the UK, incorporating his name into his advertising. 
His real name was Arthur Judney. At this time he was displaying and advertising himself as A.D. Thomas of Thomas Edison Pictures. In approximately May 1901, he had 14 shows showing in major UK cities. And unlike the other commissioners in the Mitchell and Kenyon collection, he actually had his own camera crew. Edison was described by his contemporaries as a rascal and a scoundrel, but unparalleled ability as a showman. The two other sections of this film actually reveal to us that three camera crews were filming this particular incident. It was top of the bill at the St. James's Hall for two weeks. When Lord Roberts visited Manchester on the 10th of October 1901, he was there for two reasons. Firstly, to distribute medals to the Boer War veterans, and secondly, to unveil the statue of Queen Victoria in Piccadilly. So unparalleled was the success of Lord Robert's opening that a woman fainted in the crowd. Lord Roberts was one of the great Boer War generals, including Buller and Baden-Powell, all of whom visited Manchester in 1901. Mitchell and Kenyon were at this point operating a developing printing service for A.D. Thomas. By May 1901, A.D. Thomas had used Manchester as the centre of his operations for cinematographic activities. According to reports in the Sherman's newspapers, three other cameramen were filming this event. However, this is the only film that has survived. Thomas Edison actually advertised this as illustrating the world history from day by day. The finest animated pictures ever seen in Manchester. War in Manchester. Come and see yourselves on the screen as living history. And now we see, and we believe that is the great Cecil Hepworth of Hepworth's photo company, who actually used to work with A.D. Thomas and Mitchell and Kenyon, and by 1901 had his own company distributing films.
When Lieutenant Clive Wilson returned to Trambycroft in Hull, he was welcomed by all of the employees of his father's factory and it appears a special day was given in order to celebrate the return of the war hero. He actually received a distinguished medal for what appears to be very little involvement in the Boer War. During his time in South Africa, he actually asked his mother to send him tinned partridges and a whole series of luxury items in order to make the war more bearable. Clive Wilson was the son of a very wealthy and prosperous family in Hull. Here we see the members of the family. When the film that evening was showing in Hull, the whole family were invited to a special showing of the event by Ralph Pringle, who had commissioned this film from Mitchell and Kenyon. Here we now see Clive Wilson coming in front of the camera, posing as if he's having his photograph taken and then walking up to the operator. Although the advertisements proclaimed, see the world's news days by day, many of the films were staged to actually fit a local event of a significant nature in order to bring the people into the cinematograph show. What is remarkable about this group of films is how the, the film actually seems to resemble a home movie where various members of the family are portrayed in front of the camera and doesn't seem to have the same amount of local interest as other films shot in Hull at the same time. Here we have the family now appearing in a motor car. Motor cars at the time were actually only four and a half thousand in private ownership and it shows you how wealthy the family were in contemporary terms. When Baden Powell came to Accrington on the 11th of June 1904, Albert Wilkinson, in association with Mitchell and Kenyon, filmed the event to show that evening in the local hall. People now are responding to the camera in the usual fashion employed by the commissioners and now we see Baden Powell with members of Accrington Society posing for the camera. Baden Powell was of course the hero of Mefekin and one of the great heroic characters of the Boer War. His arrival in Accrington was greeted by thousands of spectators 
with a parade of the military police, the local police, and the St John's Ambulance leading the parade. The showman exhibitors often used the same band that you see in the pictures as live performance accompaniment when the films were shown that evening or the day later in the local venue. One of the most astonishing aspects about the collection is the rapidity in which the films are actually in commission, processed and then exhibited. In many instances there's less than four hours between the actual filming of the event and the exhibiting. Often the showmen use this as part of their advertising ploy. For instance, they would film in the afternoon and then advertise in the evening, come and see yourselves on the curtain in the local hall. Now again we see the band. Again, that would have been used by Mitchell and Kenyon exhibitors, in this case Albert Wilkinson, to actually show as part of the performance. The films are always shown at this particular time as part of a two-hour performance in the local town hall, the local venue, or often, in this case, the music hall. These films were only commissioned for a purely local audience. The Baden Power films at this point would not have been part of a Boer War attraction as by 1904 the Boer War was no longer a prominent feature of major cinematographic exhibitions and was part of the stock role that Mitchell and Kenyon had in actually commissioning and turning around films within 24 hours purely made for a local purpose. However, the size of the crowd, the length of the parade shows the importance of such a notable personage to coming to Accrington at this time in 1904. Before the discovery of the Mitchell and Kenyon collection, Mitchell and Kenyon were famous for their war reenactments. Filmed in the Yellow Hills in Blackburn, it was an attempt to capture real incidents and scenes from the Transvaal. These fake Boer War films were very popular with the home audience, often showing scenes of the gallant British soldiers or Tommies with aspects of the sneaky Boer in this particular instance. When Mitchell and Kenyon made these films, they were actually advertised and sold under their company Norden. However, the showman used to do particular tricks to make the films more interesting, i.e. planting people in the audience, dressing up the exhibitors and commissioners in Boer War uniform, and also then incorporating elements of showmanship. So for example, scenes of gunfire in this film would have been accompanied on a live performance by people actually hearing gunfire. This was a common trick, and one local commentator complained that so advanced was the gunfire smoke that you couldn't see the pictures on the screen.
term factory gate comes from the original Lumiere films of the filming of the workers in, in Lyon. In this particular aspect, Mitchell and Kenyon not only produced over 105 films which have survived in the collection, but actually were commissioned by the local showman to film scenes of factory exits throughout the north of England. Messrs Lum and Son leaving the works of Huddersfield were shown at the Town Hall by Ralph Pringle and Loda Lyons, both of those who you'll see shortly coming into view. Ralph Pringle and Loda Lyons were actually working for Edison Thomas. Ralph Pringle there with the flat cap and the large moustache, and Loda Lyons, the short man with the large moustache and the big hat, were actually part of A.D. Thomas's marketing man, and by 1901 had formed their own separate company. Loda Lyons, in particular, was a ventriloquist, and contemporary reports say that during the actual exhibiting of the films, he would actually throw his voice behind the film to provide a sound effect. They were shown on the 3rd of November 1900. Pringle is there seen directing people in front of the camera, smiling with the audience, who would be actually part of the film show. With loaded lines looking at very ease at being filmed, with his hand on hips, and actually arranging people to walk in front of the camera. Pringle and Lyons were two of the most consummate showmen working for Thomas Edison. There is an element of choreography in all of the Mitchell and Canyon Factory Gate films, but usually by the end of the scene, the children become the featured attractions and refuse to respond to the directions of the showman. Pendlebury Colliery, filmed in August 1901, is definitely associated with a fairground cinematograph show. Standing behind with a gag card or a banner is actually one of the operators from Cedric's animated bioscope show. Cedric is now seen walking across and pointing directly to the cameramen. This was actually shown at Pendlebury Wakes. The element of staging in this film is very apparent. Cedric's operators, working with Mitchell and Kenyon, actually organise the processing of people in front of the camera. We see the figure of a black miner jostling with a local miner. However, we believe that this is one of the presenters on the front of Cedric's bioscope show. The gag card comes into view, advertising this will be shown at Cedric's animated bioscope show. When this film was shown, the local report commented the only party not interested in the proceedings on the screen was Cedric's toothless old lion which slept throughout the film. This was also filmed as part of the Lancashire Wakes films in association with Captain Tom Payne, a showman based in Ashton, and it was shown, we believe, at Hollywood Wakes in July 1901. This film shows the industrial importance of the factories to local Lancashire cotton and woolen communities. Over 20,000 employees were supposedly working for Lord Armstrong's Elsick Works. At the top right of the screen, Ralph Pringle in the top hat and the most smartly dressed of the people and a cigarette in mouth can be seen descending through the crowds, walking towards the camera and actually choreographing again the movement of people in front of the camera. When this film was advertised in the Oldham area, a note to the showman said that local pictures are the keynote of all animated picture shows in the district this week. The films were actually commissioned the week before the annual wakes so the workers would often work a double shift in order to get the week off for the wakes weeks. Ralph Pringle at this time was actually working in partnership with A.D. Thomas, but by January 1901 had formed his own company. 
When the Thomas Edison Animated Photo Company came to Newcastle in November 1900, two of the most consummate showmen working for A.D. Thomas were actually filming on behalf of the Thomas Edison Animated Photo Company. The marketing attraction of this film was apparent as Thomas and Pringle advertised this film as over 20,000 faces appearing in three minutes. Local newspaper reports and showman papers at the time always use people's reaction to the camera as part of the advertising policy with comments of, Oi Bill, that's me, or did you see yourself last night on the screen? These were a popular aspect of the advertising campaign. Film for the Hollywood Wakes in Oldham, in association with Captain Payne, cinematograph company. This is very typical of the factory gate films filmed in the Lancashire heartland and the cotton factories. It would have been shown in July 1901 for use on the fairground bioscope shows. The children seen in front of the camera would have been child workers. The smaller ones are obviously taking their father's or their mother's lunch to work and can be seen holding the food and standing in front of the camera. All the workforce can be seen wearing clogs and now we have one of the first stars of the Michelin Canyon films responding with his impish grin to the camera. Unlike other films made by Lumiere and Edison, the operators actually encourage this kind of behavior in front of the camera and show the vitality and physicality of the audience responding to being filmed. The operators are now organizing some kind of procession in front of the camera However, our two urchins in the middle frame refuse to respond. When Mitchell and Kenyon and the showman turned to film many of the factory gate exits in 1900 and 1901, they were usually met by a positive response from the audience and also from the factory owners. When they actually came to Raw Marsh to film Parkgate Iron and Steel Company rather than 1901, the reaction is not seen to be quite so popular by the local workforce. This would have been filmed on behalf of a fairground exhibitor to be shown at Rotherham Status, the local wakes fair held in November every year, a charter fair known locally as the Status. Over 6,000 people worked for Parkgate Company and now we see the people queuing up for their pay at dinner time. Some of them responding to the camera with great joy and vivacity. However, now we get the first example of a V-sign in film history where the aggressive manner, where he now says almost like, come and take you on if you think I'm hard enough, is not typical of the usual behavior of people being filmed by Mitchell and Kenyon.
We also have an actual fight on Canva. Not obvious if it was staged by the shaman. There seems to be a roughness, which is not actually purely staged for the Canva. Again, the children leaving would have been half-time workers, and the more smartly attired gentleman would have been the actual management. This pan shot shows the variety of workforce ranging from 10, 11 year old boys upwards to elderly gentlemen. Again, the reaction to the camera can be seen here now where the operators of Mitchell and Kenya are actually waving to the cameraman to stop the filming. One of the rare examples in the collection of not just women working, but also a working scene from a seaside. Filmed in North Shields, it shows women who followed the Scottish fleet as it came down the coast and filleting and selling the fish. The women of North Shields were renowned for their independent nature. The gentleman now wearing the white hat is actually working for Tweedale, another one of the commissioners associated with Mitchell and Kenyon. We see here the fish being ready, and now Tweedale is actually staging an impromptu bartering scene within the film and a mock battle reminiscent of the other fiction films made by Mitchell and Kenyon at the time. The blurring of fiction and reality is apparent within this title. The Tweedale operator is also seen now manhandling one of the punters and again incorporating an element of showmanship into the scene. Filmed in Liverpool in 1901 by Mitchell and Kenyon in association with Ralph Pringle. The National Maritime Museum believes this film to be the skirmisher, which would have been the vessel that would have actually then transported the passengers to the main ocean-going liner, showing scenes of the second and third class passengers. We then see scenes from the actual ship itself.
parade of the ship's crew in front of the camera is reminiscent of the Factory Gate titles. Also, aspects of the film again resemble a home movie, with the cat on the ship taking a starring role in this section. The Whitsuntide Festum was filmed on behalf of George Green and shows wonderful examples of the Edwardian fair. The switchback gondola, now shown, was one of the technological marvels of the age. Over 150 fairs took place every week in the United Kingdom and this scene is intercut with scenes of Preston Market, one of the medieval market towns still remaining. The visit of the annual fair was one of the most looked for attractions of the year and George Green combined this by showing scenes of the fairground in his Bioscope show that night. The roundabouts on display in the film would have cost an average £3,000. But the advent of the cinematograph show in the 1900s proved as popular and now we see green cinematograph where this film would actually have been shown that evening. The Manchester Band of Hope procession was filmed in June 1901 and actually forms part of many exhibitions commissioned by A.D. Thomas during his two month stay. The Band of Hope was a temperance movement aimed at promoting abstinence of alcohol and the banners themselves actually portray the influence of this temperance movement at the time. The Band of Hope was formed in order to actually safeguard the health and welfare of the children. And the processions form a popular part of their marketing ploy in order to attract new converts to the cause. target audience were children and they used the latest technologies such as the magic lantern and the cinematograph as an instrument of education in their fight against the perils of alcohol. The films reflect the importance of children and women in their fight against the evils of drink, including banners such as bread and not beer. The children often wore Sunday best and even though the nature of the exhibition and the nature of the actual march is supposed to be solemn with sobriety the order of the day, the spontaneous reaction of people to the camera shows that the actual possession was a major part of celebrations in the Manchester region.
Filmed on the Blackpool seafront for the Whitsuntide holidays in May 1904, it shows you scenes of one of the three piers in Blackpool. Promenading on the seafront was a popular attraction in the 1900s, especially for the Whitsuntide holidays. The beautiful, elaborate nature of the Victoria Pier can be seen in this film, and also the range of people promenading, not just for the holiday, but in this occurrence for the camera. The local report at the time calls this the pleasures of the promenade as seen by the cinematograph. The merry mill hands are here, frolicsome Lancashire lads and lasses, hard workers and hard players, a common meeting ground for the merchant and the mechanic, the lady of fashion and the factory lass, is the promenade where people congregate in order to take the bracing sea air and to show off their latest fashions. Blackpool at this time was the most flourishing seaside resort in the United Kingdom, an average of four to six million visitors. Now we see the promenading of the people for the camera, wearing their Sunday best for the Whitsuntide holiday. These films were actually shown not only in Blackpool, but also outside their locality. The speciality act shown on camera actually are the Mazondos, who were advertised as the champion barrel jumpers of all England. The annual carnival of Leeds and Athletic Cycling Club actually involved scenes and actors from the local Tivoli Theatre. The Mazondas are stated to be the champions in their particular line and exhibit some really marvellous tub jumping, which has the additional merit of not only being novel, but shows the athletic prowess of the lady jumper. Bizarre as it may seem, barrel jumping was actually one of the most popular acts of the variety show at the time. Jews B.V. Manningham, filmed in 1902, shows you Bradford City Football Club in its former incarnation as a Northern Union Rugby Club. Northern Union was not as popular as football at the time, but was very much associated with the heartlands of Mitchell and Kenyon. The rugby films are among the most beautifully filmed in the sporting canon. Showing close-ups of the players, the physical nature of the game, and the manly physique of the rugby players. Unlike the Factory Gate films and the other films in the collection, the rugby players seemed almost unfazed about being filmed and seemed to continue their normal sporting activity. Alongside the sporting action, Mitchell and Kenyon always filmed the crowd responding to the operator. Here we have now one of the showmen reacting with the audience and asking the people in the audience to respond to the camera by actually waving their hats or their hands or their scarf and providing what is known in showman terms as a ghee in the audience, a plant. 
The film now resembles a drama as opposed to an actual sporting event. The cinematograph show on the fairground was one of the wonders of the age. On the front of the show, before the films were shown, would be a narration, a, a stage act or strongman act. In this particular case, we believe that the showman has actually commissioned a, a theatrical reconstruction of a film that is also going to be shown in the cinematograph show itself, a farcical comedy popular at the time. Sedgwick is seen holding onto the rails and now we see James Kenyon of Mitchell and Kenyon actually orchestrating the movement of people in front of the camera to go up and down the steps. If you watch the scene closely you'll see the same faces appearing not just once but twice. Kenyon is now seen pushing the people through. The two boys now coming down, appearing in front of the camera on at least two different occasions. The action of the people to being filmed was always orchestrated by the commissioners. And the scene finishes with Kenyon standing next to the advertising board for Sedgwick's animated bioscope show, illustrating the film was not only filmed on the same day, but exhibited that evening in the bioscope show. Mitchell and Kenyon filmed the great local derby when Accrington played church the 5th of July 1902. We see not only the cricketers but also the operators in the straw hats parading in front of the camera and responding. Church were wholly out of form on this particular day, and the report of the actual match proclaimed fortune favours Accrington. The umpires and the officials of the match now can be seen. And finishes with the groundsman and the showman turning it into a family picture showing his daughter. Only five cricket titles have survived. The Catholic procession in Halifax in 1905 
shows the importance of the streets as a venue for all forms of processional activities. The ornateness and elaborate nature of the Catholic procession can be seen with choir boys, altar boys and banners of Our Lady being the main focus of the actual celebrations. Local school children, former part of the Catholic communities, would have saved for a year to form part of the WIT celebrations or the annual May Day parades. With this being the only opportunity for local Catholic communities at the time to show pride in their faith. The statue of Our Lady is carried by four altar boys from the local congregations, leading us to believe that this is in fact a May Day procession as opposed to a Whitsuntide procession. The solemn nature of this film is in complete contrast to some of the other processional films. However, the girls cannot help but respond to the camera. Children who actually appeared in the processions were told by their local communities to act solemn at all occasions in order to not show the Catholic faith in a bad light. The crowd and spectators watching both the procession and the filming congregate in front of the camera in order to get themselves on the screen. Burnley v Manchester United was filmed on the 6th of December 1902 and is perhaps one of the poorest films in the collection in terms of its photographic quality. Its interest is that it is believed to be the first film that features Manchester United in their first season as Manchester United. United, who were then better known as Newton Heath, were now at this point in the second division when they played Burnley in December 1902. No record of the film showing has been found, possibly due to the fact of the poor quality of the material, but also that the home team, in this case Burnley, lost 2-0 with goals by Peg for Manchester United. Less than 2,000 people witnessed this match at Turf Moor in Burnley and shows the inauspicious beginnings to arguably the world's most famous football club. Throughout the newspaper report at the time, the team are referred to as Manchester United, who were better known as Newton Heath. And the commentators often call them the United, as opposed to Manchester United. In complete contrast, Sheffield United were the premier football team at the time. Again in complete contrast to the Manchester United v Burnley film, Bramall Lane appears to have a large capacity.
This film features Sheffield United v Bury and shows you the crowd at Bramwell Lane and arguably the most famous footballer of the time, William Fatty Folk, Sheffield United's infamous goalkeeper who also played for Chelsea and Bradford City. Although we may laugh at Fatty's bulk at this time, goalkeepers needed to be very big and hefty because they were not allowed to keep the ball for any longer than three seconds and actually the centre forwards could knock the ball out of their hands. However, if you were faced with a man Malton that was Fatty Folks, you would think twice before doing that. One local story about Fatty Folks at the time is during a, a particular FA Cup game for Sheffield United. At a half time, he ate all 22 pies on offer to both teams and is possibly the instigator of the very famous football chant Who Ate All the Pies? The showman elements of this film can be captured in the first frames and we see the man in top hat and tails bowing to the camera. This is none other than Charles Poole of Poole's Myorama, who travelled the country with a pre-cinematographic show incorporating films and magic lanterns. This was egg rolling on Easter Monday in Preston, a long-standing local tradition which involved children boiling hard-boiled eggs and painting them with faces and then rolling them down the local park. Thousands of Prestonians would congregate on Avonham Park. Families would dress up, the people with Easter bonnets and children carrying baskets of eggs can all be seen in the film, as again can be Charles Poole directing and throwing the eggs towards the camera in order to get the encouragement of the local people to actually respond to being filmed. Paul is now actually signalling to the cameraman to stop the filming. After the egg rolling, children and local families would have picnics in the park, sometimes actually skipping matches, local entertainments, and often local football matches would be encouraged. Over 20,000 people have supposedly appeared for the Preston egg rolling in 1901. And again, the people are being filmed at this particular frame are responding as if they're being photographed as opposed to being filmed. This scene was reminiscent of a kind of best baby competition. And some of the elaborate hats worn by the girls can be seen in view. In the particular case, the child in the pram wearing an Easter bonnet. The city centre landscapes or the street films are perhaps the most vibrant and energetic of all the Mitchell and Kenyon canon. In this case, Mitchell and Kenyon are organising the filming of a steam tram in the centre of Wigan in August 1902. The showman operators are seen providing a farcical moment reminiscent of the first film done by the Lumiere Brothers in 1895 of a gardener with a hose pipe and introducing a comic element into what was possibly a more formal opening event. The 
showmen actively encourage the audience to respond to the camera with play acting, comic incidents, with the crowd not knowing whether to respond to the camera or to see the curious incident behind them. It was shown in Wigan Town Hall in August 1902, before the coronation celebrations, and formed part of a two-hour film show, Life in Wigan, by our old friend, Mr Ralph Pringle, who can be seen at the back of the film. This film reflects the true beauty of the Mitchell and Kenyon collection. Other filmmakers film the world, Mitchell and Kenyon bring the world to us. This opens with a beautiful snow-covered industrial landscape of Halifax and was filmed in January 1902. This film stands out in the collection because it's one of the few that focus purely on the landscape as opposed to the people in the streets or in the factories or the bustling industrial life of the major northern cities. It was part of a two-hour film show in January 1902 at the Victoria Hall at Halifax, entitled A Trip Around the World via Halifax. The advertisement for the film actually concludes with a line the tour will conclude with local animated pictures of Halifax and District, which were taken today and will form part of the main central attraction and feature performance tonight. The film is more reminiscent of the type of films popular at the time of Phantom Rides, Phantom Journeys, where Mitchell and Kenyon and other film operators actually film from the front or back of moving vehicles to produce a phantom ride effect and to give people the idea of journey and travel from the seat of a cinematograph show. So unlike other films in the collection, which capture Edwardians in their everyday activities, this is actually a dramatic sweeping view of the countryside as you enter Halifax, filmed on the tram route, which now forms part of the A629. Commissioned on April the 10th, 1904, this is one of the most vibrant and interesting scenes in the Mitchell and Kenyon Street films, showing not only the Phantom Ride, but also staging and elements of the film being suggested by the actions of the Mitchell and Kenyon cameramen in association with New Century Pictures, as they then plant and encourage the girls to walk past the tram again in order to capture them on screen. They take us into the heart of the Edwardian city of Bradford and show us elements of consumer society, in this case, three smartly dressed young girls walking down the road. And then the operators of New Century Pictures and Mitchell and Kenyon films parallel walking alongside the tram tracks and encouraging local people to respond to the camera on the side of the tram. The film was commissioned by Sidney Carter and shown at the St George's Hall in Bradford as part of a two-hour performance. It was advertised as local pictures of busy Bradford. It 
illustrates the tram journey from Manningham Lane to Lister Park. Which shows the highly skilled level of showmanship and actually is a rare example of both a phantom ride and an industrial city centre scene. Mitchell and Kenyon were probably of the opinion that a phantom ride in itself was not just a good enough attraction of a local film. However, then they incorporated elements of the audience by actually having them appear alongside the tram. Jamaica Street, Glasgow, one of the most important streets in the centre of Glasgow, filmed April 1901 by our old friend Mr Thomas and is reminiscent of some of the earlier street films in the collection. Although earlier films of Glasgow exist, this is perhaps one of the most beautiful, showing a cross-section of urban life, people going about their busy life, and the way the traffic flows. Traffic are flowing in 1901 at a far more rapid pace than the modern day scene of Glasgow. The film finishes with capturing a group of employees in a parade marching at the top of Jamaica Street. And this film formed part of attraction of life in Glasgow, where A.D. Thomas claimed that over 8,000 people per day came to see this film when it was shown in April 1901. Riding the tram car through Belfast reveals the supremacy of the horse tram car as a form of transport. Belfast actually didn't introduce electrified trams until 1905. The tram travels along the Royal Avenue. Eight men with advertising boards advertising the North American Animated Photo Company can be seen in view. This is a popular trick used by theatre owners at the time, but this is the first example that we have of the cinematographic showman incorporating this advertising tradition into the films. These wheeling gag cards actually tell us that the North American Animated Photo Company was showing the film at the Ulster Hall that night. This is a way of copywriting the film that nobody else can show this title because it quite clearly shows it was commissioned on behalf of this particular showman for Mitchell and Kenyon.
We believe this is filmed around the 27th of May, 1901, and is one of the most interesting titles because the, the camera and tripod were placed on the front of the upper deck of the horse tram. The filming is notably smooth, and the camera favoured the shops and pedestrians on the side, incorporating both a phantom tram film and also scenes of local people. When A.D. Thomas came to Ireland in December 1901, January 1902, after filming in Dublin, he went to Wexford for two weeks and filmed scenes of life in Wexford. Information on this film is contained in the diaries of Louis de Klerk, a cameraman who worked for A.D. Thomas at the time. The scenes of poverty and rural life are shown in the Wexford. This is the actual Wexford market. It was shown on Monday the 20th of January at the Theatre Royal in Wexford. Filming took place on the Saturday and the films were actually commissioned in Wexford and then sent across the Irish Sea to be processed in Blackburn and then returned within 48 hours. A.D. Thomas filmed in Manchester in May 1901 and advertised his film as Manchester Street Scenes. It was part of a two-hour show at the St. James's Hall. The audience would have been two types of people, working class people, who would have paid sixpence to see the show. However, Thomas also instigated a policy of carriages could actually arrive 15 minutes earlier and pay a shilling so as not to sit with Joe Public. This shows the bustling centre of Manchester. It's the intersection of Cross Street and Corporation Street, the lively movement of passengers, people, electric and both horse-driven tram. When this film was shown, Thomas claimed in his adverts that over 8,000 people besieged the St James's Hall for two showings a day to see the local film. Thomas is now seen holding the child up to the camera, and presenting a medal to one of the Boer War soldiers and free tickets for people to come and see his show. Prices range from sixpence to a shilling and local films are always at the centre of the attraction. City centre scenes were far more popular than scenes of Paris or New York, other films that were shown at the time because it gave people not just the opportunity to see themselves on the screen, but also their environment. Thomas Edison came to Morecambe in July 1903. 
and film one of the most beautiful of all, surviving in the Mitchell and Kenyon collection. We're taken from the front of a horse tram, a Morecambe promenade. It shows you a panoramic view of the surrounding bay and was shown at the Winter Gardens in 1901. Morecambe itself at the time was not as popular a seaside resort as Blackpool. However, it was very popular from visitors from West Yorkshire, in particular Bradford, as Morecambe was actually known as Bradford by the Sea. The tram is now entering around the bay and we see the stone jetty in the background. Throughout the film and all the other Morecambe titles, the local school children appear in several scenes and it appears that not only were they captured on this film but followed the Mitchell and Kenyon A.D. Thomas operators as they filmed on this particular day. Scenes of them in the Morecambe films actually help us with the dating as we realise with the reappearance of the children that these films must have been filmed and shown on the same day. The women are holding power cells for the sun and the dress is a mixture of mourning due to the death of Queen Victoria and summer clothing. If you can see your family, your grandparents on screen, please contact the British Film Institute. We would be eager to have any stories that you believe would help with the dating and contextualisation of this collection.